look who's coming up. Welcome to another edition of Ultimate Fantasy Sports Daily. My name is Dean Millard, and it is uh, awesome to have you aboard uh, the Monday edition, kicking the week off just perfectly. Some just wild things happening on the weekend as we will uh, recap throughout the show. Uh, Joining us on the program today will be Jamie Thomas of Jets Radio, also uh, executive director of our Twitch channel. And we're going to get a double shot of our Dauber Hockey preview, the Predators and the Devils. Uh, We had Michael Amato, and we did a a whole preview, uh, a bunch of them last week, but we have missed some shows uh, due to... uh, circumstances out of our control so um we're gonna double up on the dauber hockey today with the predators and the devils working our way through the nhl alphabetically preseason games underway there is way too many there's eight preseason games do you want to know the reason why so many guys get invited to camps and ptos so that teams can meet their veteran requirements in these uh, exhibition games, especially the split squad games. They're the worst. They are the worst. Child, please. So we're going to talk about uh, the Preds and the Devils today. Some interesting situations with both teams. Um, you know, I, I think the... The Predators have been contenders, you know, really, really, really good for a long time, but have only taken that step once. But now they actually have some really intriguing fantasy options. And Fantasy Thunderdome uh, will come your way a little bit later on the program. Two players enter, one leaves. Uh, You decide on our Twitch message board. By the way, thanks to everybody for uh, joining us on Twitch today. Uh... Please chime in, tell us where you're watching from, uh, who you are. Sometimes I don't know everybody through uh, the nicknames and things like that. So chime in on uh, the Twitch message board. I'd love to chat with everybody. I love the interaction portion of the show. Uh, I should probably shut my ringer off, though, uh, just in case. Um, okay, some some really cool things to talk about um, as we get set for Major League Baseball's playoffs. There is a new documentary uh, that is going to be coming out about the Yankees and the Dodgers. They met three times, uh, 78, 79, 80, or, and then 81, the D- Dodgers won the, the strike-shortened season. So it's amazing to, to look at the history. And that's a lot of Reggie Jackson. So if you're a Dodger fan, you're not a Reggie Jackson fan, you might not want to uh, be watching that. Uh, by the way, Ernie chiming in saying my mobile device is where I'm watching from. Ah, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for spending your data on our show. We really appreciate that. Uh, also, if anybody wants a ad-free experience here on Twitch, You just have to uh, pay for a full subscription and you get ad-free content here on Ultimate Fantasy Sports Daily. So anyway, something cool for baseball fans, uh, Yankee fans, Dodger fans. I think it would be amazing with this documentary coming out if we had a Yankees-Dodgers World Series. With the Dodgers winning, of course. Um, And, of course, we will follow along. The Jays taking on the uh, Yankees tonight. Aaron Judge did not get to 62 on the weekend. uh, And and it was interesting. I was watching. I was at the Oil King game on Friday night uh, in which they lost to the Red Deer Rebels. Red Deer's going to be a good team this year. Uh, Who's the uh, Craig Armstrong, I think, was the guy I really, really liked in that game. But, anyway, I was watching the Yankee game. They put it on free. They put it free. It was supposed to be an Apple TV game, but they made it free. Just had to have an Apple account because of the history that could have been made, and it wasn't, unfortunately. So, no uh, Aaron Judge, but... 
That same night, Albert Pujols did hit number 699 and number 700 in L.A. where he played last year, where he said he fell in love with the game again. So some really cool baseball stories uh, that we will touch on uh, throughout the program as well. All right, let's get to our uh, question of the day. Um, and actually, um, let's get to our top three first because the question of the day, have an, unfortunately, I apologize, we're having a few technical problems today. So this is the uh, top three. Uh, I'm just going to uh, do a quick change uh, when it comes to our question of the day because the last uh, show's question is up there. It did not save. So, uh, as you look at my top three, uh, there, okay, uh, I have it fixed now, we'll uh, dive back into the question of the day, and then we'll get to the top three in a second. Who is the worst looking NFL team after three weeks of the season? Uh, there's a few unbeaten teams uh, in the NFL, one only in the entire AFC, that is the Miami Dolphins. I love that I'm saying that. It's just very surprising. Um, there's a couple of unbeaten teams in the NFC in the Philadelphia Eagles who uh, look like they have a great quarterback as well. You know, a Miami-Philly Super Bowl with Tua versus Jalen Hurts, that could be exciting. The New York Giants are also uh, 2-0. and um, They'll take on the Dallas Cowboys tonight in Monday Night Football. What a... Uh, I, I don't really find that an appealing matchup, unfortunately. So I'll be watching uh, the Jays try to get, uh, solidify their playoff spot, is the word I was looking for, and try to hold Aaron Judge off of uh, the home run. I mean, the Boston Red Sox, they went at him. They, they threw him fastballs. They, they didn't, you know, they, they did walk him a few times, but they didn't hide uh, from Aaron Judge. So that's what I'll be watching. But anyway, what is the worst for me, it's the, the Raiders. The Raiders have, you know, they're, they're only um, minus 13 in point differential. So it's not like they're, they're getting crushed, but they're just, just, they just look terrible. They went out and got Devontae Adams. They're Josh Jacobs. You know, I guess maybe he wasn't feeling all that well, but for me, it's the Raiders. And, and that's obviously, um, that's my favorite team. Uh, but some of the teams like, you know who doesn't look good and is three and is two and one is Denver. Cincinnati doesn't look that good, although they only gave up two sacks last week, which was huge. And let's hope Joe Burrow stays off of social media. Arnie says the Jets are bad as always, but they're getting fantasy production. That's the interesting thing. In Joe Flacco, you trust. Hopefully not. But So uh, who is the worst-looking NFL team after uh, three weeks of the season? Now, here is uh, the top three. And uh, as we usually do on Mondays, um, we are looking at uh, things that we learned over the weekend in the NFL. So this is a, an, an interesting one. When you looked at re, four, in, you know, of the best quarterbacks, you know, that we've watched for a long time and will watch for the next ten years, hopefully, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, and Josh Allen, they were all in action on the weekend, and these were their scores in points. 12, 14, 17, and 19. So the defenses held the big four to less than 20 points. That's pretty impressive. Not for fantasy. Like, if you're, if you're looking at you have Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Holmes, or Josh Allen in fantasy, it wasn't a great day for you yesterday. But that is quite interesting to see that happen uh, with those four quarterbacks. Especially, you know, Josh Allen is, you know, you're thinking you're getting... 30 points minimum. And then the number two thing. The fact that the Denver Broncos are 2-1 and one is crazy. We know what happened in the first week. Then they, you know, they, they did win. 
obviously, uh, last week, but I don't know. It was, uh, it was a weird sort of week. And then, interesting, I was reading an article about uh, breaking down Nathaniel Hackett yesterday. And actually, it, it kind of, you know, because the, the microscope is on this guy. Like, he made terrible decisions with timeouts and obviously not giving Wilson the ball in week one. They bring in some outside help. And there were situations where, should they have gone for it? Russell Wilson came up just short on a first down. They punted, put the hand the ball in the or, or the fate of the game in the hands of their defense, which was you know, playing pretty well in that game. And then they 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 let Russell Wilson come back, and you know he led the charge. The, this offense does not look good in Denver, but they made good decisions yesterday. So it's just amazing to look at the whole tornado of, of a gong show with the Denver Broncos right now. And they're two and one. Like, I'll be honest with you. I thought that the Raiders would be maybe where Denver is. And Denver would be maybe where the Raiders are. And, you know, Kansas city, they're leading tied with Denver. Uh, the Chargers have all kinds of injury concerns now. You know, what I thought was going to be the strongest division, the AFC West, is upside down other than Kansas City. Crazy. And the third thing that I learned is that we definitely need more coach cameras. I mean, Ken Dorsey of the Bills went viral when he seemingly destroyed everything in sight in the press box when things went sideways against the Dolphins. This is beautiful. This is, this is a beautiful, like, this is me. This is like 13-year-old me when Steve Smith banks it in off Grant Fuhrer. This is me. When Glenn Wesley misses an empty net in 88 or 90, whatever it was, against the Oilers, and DeMoe couldn't get his cup, that's me. When the Dodgers lose to the Astros because they cheated, this is me. We need more coach cams. Uh, like, he's going to get fined because Brady broke three tablets last week and got, they freaked out. But this is awesome. Like, th- I might just leave this up on a loop for the rest of the show. Just wild. Absolutely wild. So that's my top three. Uh, What did you learn about the National Football League over the weekend? Would love to know your top three things you learned when it came to the National Football League. I mean, it's been an interesting start. I don't think you can say it hasn't been interesting, but as, you know, as far as fantasy football performers, it has been, it's been a little bit, uh, kind of up in the air for some, for some teams. Now there's, there's obviously some, uh, players who have absolutely delivered, but it's been a bit topsy turvy, I think for some people. How is your fantasy football season going? Is this how it's going? Or are you off to a good start? I, I'm crushing it right now. We lost the first week. So far, so good. Now, this is the type of the year where we have so much fun. Because we, we get to watch football, hockey, baseball, and basketball all at the same time. I mean, it's great. If you're in all four fantasy leagues, oh, you're going to be so busy. Uh, but this is the, the time of the year where you can literally watch, and depending on where you live, you can watch all four of those sports live. Like, that would be the great thing about going uh, to an L.A. or, or Chicago or um, Boston, places like that where you have all four sports. Well, there's lots of other ones, but that, that's, this is the best time of fantasy when you're checking four lineups for four, and, and lots of people are in many more uh, fantasy leagues than, than just that one a, as well. So uh, it's, it's, it's a fun time of the year. Went and watched some actual hockey over the weekend, uh, live hockey action. So that was uh, quite fun as well. 
And yeah, as I mentioned, it's uh, it's called an uncivil war. And it is uh, an ESPN Films documentary on the intense 1970s rivalry between the New York Yankees and the Los Angeles Dodgers. September 27th at 9 p.m. Eastern, Rob Lowe will uh, narrate uh, the documentary about the two teams squaring off in back-to-back uh, World Series from 1978 and 70, 77 and 78. Reggie Jackson was the hero, and then the Dodgers won in 81, the strike-shortened season. So definitely uh, looking forward to that for sure. Uh, and then, you know, what are you looking at for tonight's Cowboys and Giants game? Uh, do you have fantasy protection? Obviously, uh, uh, Saquon is going to be uh, an early favorite. Uh, looking at some betting props tonight. Tony Pollard, 15 plus receiving yards, minus 205. Daniel Jones, under 194 and a half passing yards, plus 130. I, I think Daniel Jones definitely throws for less than 200 yards. I think that's definitely uh, something that's going to happen. All right, uh, we are going to duck out uh, for a, uh, or I am going to duck out. There's there's nobody here uh, but me. I'm going to duck out for a short uh, commercial break. Uh, We'll get into uh, top shelf fantasy performers. Unfortunately, Aaron Judge was not one of them, but maybe tonight against the Blue Jays. Also, Jamie Thomas is going to join us. But when we come back, it's our Dauber Hockey Preview, the first of two. We've got a double shot of Dauber Hockey today. It is the Nashville Predators. One more time, let's take a look at uh, Ken Dorsey. Just snapping as we head to break here on Ultimate Fantasy Sports Daily. We are back right after this.
All right, thank you so much for sticking around uh, the program. This is Ultimate Fantasy Sports Daily. My name is Dean Millard, and uh, it is a pleasure uh, to have you aboard uh, the program. We're here Monday to Friday, 4 to 6 p.m., uh, taking you through uh, the best uh, and the worst sometimes when it comes to uh, fantasy sports. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's always uh, winners and there's always losers, and there's uh, a lot more losers than winners when it comes to uh, fantasy sports. Okay, uh, we are going to dive into our Dauber Hockey uh, team previews. Um, we're very proud to be partnered uh, with Dauber Hockey, and by the way, Dauber Hockey is going to fill a void uh, for you this year when it comes to news, uh, NHL news, because of Roto World NBC Edge ending the player news feed, Dauber Hockey is stepped forward. So, fantasy hockey fans, have no fear. You can also get the Dauber Hockey Fantasy Guide. Uh, just check it out at DauberHockey.com. So, we are going with the Nashville Predators uh, in our Dauber Hockey. First of two uh, Dauber Hockey previews today, actually. Um, and uh, like I was saying earlier, the Predators uh, have been a team that has uh, all you know been a I think a playoff contender for sure uh, for a long, long time uh, when it comes to the NHL playoffs. Uh, but also um, they've they've had some good fantasy, especially fantasy defensemen. Like they have produced obviously amazing NHL defensemen. But the fantasy defenseman that they have produced is quite incredible. Now, when we look at this, uh, this is from uh, Puckpedia, uh, where we get the faceoffs. There is obviously no left winger uh, on the second line. So, obviously, there's some updating that needs to be done. But, you know, I look at this Philip Forsberg, uh, this Nashville team. Philip Forsberg is, you know, to me, the offensive leader. Uh, for, up front, anyway. Uh, like, I think that this is a team that, you know, doesn't have Ryan Ellis anymore, and Roman Yossi had an even better season last year with, you know, 19 goals and or predicted to have 19 goals and 82 assists this year. Um, I, I Like, Yossi last year had uh, 90 points. He had over 90 points, I think. I think he had over 23 goals. So it's amazing what happens, you know, when – you know, I'm not saying Ryan Ellis uh, was the reason leaving, but it's just amazing um, what happens. Um, you know, when when a guy gets even more freedom, and we saw points definitely go up last year. Uh, there's there's no doubt about it. We saw uh, point totals increase last year. So Forsberg uh, and Matt Duchesne, I'm hesitant to to think Ryan Johansson is going to produce, uh, even at the level he did last year, 63 points. Ryan Johansson has had one season in the 70s when it comes to a total points. So, last year, he had a 63-point season. As mentioned, offense was up. I could definitely see Ryan Johansson taking a step back. That's why I didn't put him as one of the top three stars and Yossi is uh, the third one with, with Matt Duchesne. The breakout candidate for me is Eli Tolvanen. Tolvanen has been the guy. You know, some called him the best player outside of North America at different times. Uh, first round pick coming up, I think, six years now. But has never really had much of uh, sniff and I think last year was maybe the first year he played close to a full season so I'm looking at him as a breakout player uh, this year especially if this guy fills that second line void uh, that is out there 
And then the sleeper pick that I'm going with is Nino Niederreiter. Again, another guy that I expected a lot more out of in his NHL career. But if you get to 20 goals, that's pretty good. And you're going to be able to get Nino Niederreiter like way late in your draft. So, yeah, unless it's a dynasty league that you're redraft, you know, he's available. But Nino Niederreiter for me is uh, is is a sleeper pick this year. Now let's take a look at what Dauber Hockey has for the lineups for the Nashville Predators. And, and remember, we talked with Michael Amato last week on Thursday about kind of guys needing some line luck. And there is that here as well. I, like, I mean, if Ryan Johansson centering the second line, Eli Tolvanen and Philip Tomasino, are there, Tomasino they're going to have to prove that they belong there. Because there's a guy in Tanner Jeanette that had 20 goals last year, and there's or that could have 20 goals this year. What did what did Tanner Jeanette? I know he had a bunch of hits and a bunch of penalty minutes. I think he had over 20 goals. They're predicting him to get 20 this year. So there are guys waiting in the wings on this Nashville team. If guys like Tolvanen and and Tomasino don't come out of the gate swinging. Arnie's saying, in any of my drafts, Nino has never been drafted. I think this is a sleeper guy, a, a third-line guy who, who, let's face it, at some point, those guys are going to struggle. At some point, Tolvanen's going to struggle, maybe right out of the bat. At some, like, Nino Niederreiter is going to get second-line time in Nashville. Another guy to watch is Cody Glass. Didn't work out in Vegas, didn't work out in Philly, didn't work out anywhere so far. This guy has goal scoring ability. On the blue line, Ryan McDonough is a bit of a sleeper option. I like Matias Ekholm. I think he's been dangerously underrated. And, and of course, you see Soros. This is a guy that, you know, could push 40 wins, maybe. He's going to play a lot. So this is a team that I look and I see, obviously, production from the top line and then fluctuation on that second line other than Ryan Johansson. I think Ryan Johansson's going to end up with a lot of different line mates this year. It'd be nice if, if they could be consistent and you could look at Eli Tolvin and, and say, yeah, this guy is... Th- this." Th- this is the guy who we thought we were, to, to, to quote Dennis Green. I mean, everybody is waiting for this guy. So I think there's an opportunity to maybe grab some Predators later on in your draft. And if you can, you know, stash them or at least put some of these guys on the watch list. I don't know. If goals are worth more, Nino Niederreiter getting 22 goals could be beneficial as a sleeper option. Now, Phil Tomasino is, is uh, I, I think he's an interesting uh, uh, player. Double-digit goals last year, 32 points. But he's gotten better and better uh, as he's as he's gone on uh, from his time with the, the Canada World or the U eighteen program uh, to Niagara and Oshawa, and then eventually the Chicago Wolves, where he scored thirteen goals in twenty nine games. So this is a guy who has been tracking arrow up, as Tom Rennie would say. And again, I think there's going to be a point where he's going to. F- uh, you know, hit some roadblocks and and be moved around. But these are two guys who you could look at as de- def- uh, definitive guys who could either break out. You know, you could e- you can even call uh, Tomasino and Tolvanen sleepers if you want to. I I look at uh, Tolvanen as a potential breakout, especially if they have him down for a thirty a twenty goal season. I think if that line can stay together consistently. Maybe you can get 45 points, 50 points out of Tolvanen. Same with Tomasino. 
Ryan Johansson's a really good passer. So if that line can stay together, fine. But like we talked about last Thursday with Michael Amato, you're going to need a little line luck with whoever you grab. Whether it's, uh, whether it's line luck to have Tolvin and, and Tomasino stay up there with Ryan Johansson and, and get a good look, or if, if you're looking at like Tanner Janot uh, with the penalty minutes and the hits, or Nino Niederreiter, uh, you know, fills out a few different categories, plus a 22-goal guy potentially, you're hoping for those guys. Because I don't know if Nino Niederreiter is going to be as productive. Well, I know he's not. He's, Nino Niederreiter is only going to be productive in my mind if he gets bumped up to that second line. So still a sleeper option. I still think there's potential for him to play with Ryan Johansson at, at times this year. Same with Jeanette. That guy throws the body around a lot. So he, there's going to be an opportunity for him to move up the lineup. So some line luck needed in that second, third line, uh, but draft away with those first three guys, Michael Grandlin, Matt Duchesne, Philip Forsberg, Roman Yossi. Dante Fabro, I thought he would have been better by now. Um, actually traded him in, in the one big league that I'm in, the UFHL. Uh, he was a guy we wanted to build around. Just hasn't taken that step like other Nashville defensemen have. And he might get passed on the depth chart, you know. Like, this is a guy that you might want to avoid. Certainly, you're drafting Ryan, uh, Roman Yossi, Matthias Ekholm. Um, you know, McDonough could come in handy. Like that whole right side of Carrier, Lazan, Fabro. Who knows what's going to happen with that? I, like I said, Dante Fabro has not taken the steps forward that I think fantasy owners and the Nashville Predators in particular were hoping he would. And in goal, no question, UC Saros. That was UC Saros, the top five goalie? Probably not. Maybe after this year, though. If he gets into the 40 wins, maybe this year. Maybe after this year. So what do you think of the Predators um, as a fantasy option? How deep do you go? As Arnie said, Nino Niederreiter has never been drafted in any of his. I don't know how deep those leagues are. He's obviously going to be drafted in 32 team leagues. But how deep do you go? Do you go full Top six, as Dauber has it uh, laid out here. And then you wait on guys. Like, I think Tanner Jeanette's getting drafted because of the hits and the PIMS. So do you go top, is there a top seven for forwards? And do you think Dante Fabro can turn into an offensive defenseman? It's not looking like it right now. But then again, he's only 24 years old. And he's only played 174 NHL games. I'm still not convinced Dante Fabro is going to be a uh, top-line fantasy performer. But who knows? So that is the Nashville Predators of our Dauber Hockey Team preview. Uh, we're going to take a look at the New Jersey Devils a little bit later on in the show. But if you have something to chat about when it comes to the Preds, uh, maybe something I missed or you disagree with something I said, please uh, drop it in the uh, Twitch chat message board or you can hit me up on Twitter at Duck Millard. You can also get me at UFS Network. And you can check us out at UFF Sports as well. All right, Fantasy Thunderdome, and we will get much more into the National Football League as well uh, when it come to, came to fantasy yesterday. This is Ultimate Fantasy Sports Daily on the Ultimate Fantasy Sports Network. We're back in just a few minutes.
Excuse me, apologize uh, for coughing in your ear there. Uh, my name is Dean Millard. This is Ultimate Fantasy Sports Daily. Thanks for uh, tuning in. It is 4.41 p.m. Eastern time. Of course, Giants, Cowboys tonight. We'll have a Monday Night Football watch party right here on our twitch.tv slash ultimate fantasy sports channel. So make sure you tune in for that. If you missed uh, Andy's ultimate fantasy football show yesterday, uh, you're missing out on Sundays. It's excellent. And we'll be here Monday to Friday, 4 till 6 p.m. Eastern time. I'm so glad uh, you were able to join me today. Jamie Thomas will join us a little bit later on the program. Uh, but we're going to get into some uh, performers, uh, top performers of uh, the night. Let's start with uh, some Major League Baseball. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, Stephen Kwan of uh, the Guardians. Pretty impressive uh, night out uh, for the guy that plays all three uh, outfield positions. Racks up 19 points by going three for five, scoring two runs, one uh, home run, and five RBIs. Also stole a couple of bases. I love it. Didn't commit any errors. Didn't strike out. No minuses. An OPS of 1.800. So that is your top of the night leader. Very impressive. And it's also uh, extremely impressive what the uh, Guardians have done. Clinching a playoff berth. Clinching the Central Division in the American League. That's wild. Congratulations, Tom Hanks and the Guardians. Uh, all right, uh, Pete Alonso of the New York Mets. Uh, they are also bound for the playoffs. So maybe this is an all, well, this is an all playoff edition of Top Shelf Fantasy Night now that I look at it. Uh, anyway, back to what the Polar Bear did. He also had a home run. He also had five RBIs. He had three runs scored. He went four for five. The polar bear didn't commit an error, didn't cut caught stealing, didn't strike out, no minuses, 2.6 OPS. And so the reason he's a point less than Quan is probably the uh, stolen bases because that's pretty impressive uh, stuff. George Springer also uh, had a good night for the Blue Jays as well. Two home runs uh, for the guy who I felt was a disappointment last year, Kyle Schwarber. Hit a couple of long balls for Philly last night as well. Man, everybody in the playoffs. Uh, playoffs going deep uh, when it comes to last night. Playoffs. Uh, as for some pitchers, let's check out what they did on the bump last night. Uh, Christian Javier of the Astros, also bound for the playoffs. 17-point night, six innings uh, on the hill. He did not give up an earned run, so that gives him the quality start bump. I didn't get the win, though, as uh, Baltimore would have battled back. One hit, eight strikeouts, no ERA, uh, no earned runs, rather. Uh, so pretty impressive. And Nestor Cortez Jr. Uh, gets the Yankees a 2 nothing shutout victory last night thanks to six innings. The quality start, because there were no earned runs, did uh, give up two walks, five strikeouts, and just one hit. Pretty impressive night. Nestor Cortez Jr. picks up 16 points uh, for the New York Yankees. So, yeah, indeed, an all-playoff matchup. Playoff. Edition of Top Shelf Fantasy Night. And uh, obviously the, the matchups continue, but it's a, it's a weird evening in Major League Baseball tonight. I think there was actually only four games. Yeah, there, there's literally four games, and only one of them doesn't have some sort of playoff implication. That's the Reds and the Pirates. So in the Who Cares Bowl, uh, Contreras will pitch for the Pirates, and you'll see Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson on the hill for the Reds. Elsewhere, you got the Braves and the Nationals. Uh, you know, the Braves are, are still fighting for position. The Yankees and the Blue Jays. We've got a lot to look at in that game when you've got Aaron Judge chasing 62. You've got the Yankees and the Blue Jays also battling for a playoff spot. The Yankees are, uh, I think they've clinched the division. And then the Orioles and the Red Sox. The Orioles are still holding out hope that they can get into a wild card spot. 
Uh, the Yankees have not clinched a uh, division. They've clinched a playoff spot. So there's still a chance. There's The, the magic number is two. Uh, so any combination of a Yankee win, Blue Jay loss, and, and it's over. So it's for all sense and purposes, it's done. But you do have Toronto. And then in the, in the wild card, you have Baltimore that is holding out hope that they can catch uh, either Seattle or Tampa Bay. I guess they could catch Toronto. But they're um, they're six and a half back of uh, Toronto, so that's going to be pretty pretty hard. But they're only four games back of Seattle, so that is doable. And Seattle has not been the most consistent; just three wins in their last ten. So, I, I there's definitely some excitement. Uh, certainly, um, when you're watching Toronto and you're watching tonight and the Yankees, you're watching Aaron Judge chase history. He's still stuck at 60, 10 games to go. And it's funny, we had a poll question a while back about when Judge would do this. This is the series that a lot of people picked. And I'm like, he's going to get it done way earlier than this. Like, I think this was going to be taken care of a while back. So it, the interesting thing about this is, um, where is the, the, the tweet? Larry Fisher, my good friend Larry Fisher, sent this tweet uh, to my attention. It's from TSN, but... On this day in 1961, Roger Maris tied Babe Ruth for most single-season home runs in the AL at 60. Today, exactly 61 years later, Aaron Judge could tie Maris for 61. Again, I don't believe in a whole lot of stuff. But I do believe somebody is pulling strings if it happens tonight. Just like the night that Pujols and Serena uh, and Bichette and uh, Biggio and Guerrero Sr. all did stuff. And then 20 years later, it was the kids. So if it happens tonight, then there's, there's definitely uh, something. What did happen on the weekend on Friday night was Albert Pujols, 700 home run club. Now the question is, how much more can he get? How close can he get to Babe Ruth in the last nine games? He said he's retiring no matter what. What do you think? How close does Albert Pujols get to Babe Ruth? I think he ends, I think he gets, I think he can hit, like he's so loose right now, he's just going to be swinging easy. I think he hits five more home runs. And, and you know, obviously, unless the uh, the Cardinals have other ideas of, of what they want to do with uh, Albert Pujols down the stretch. You know, St. Louis hasn't clinched a playoff spot yet. Their magic number is three. Any combination of three Milwaukee losses and three St. Louis wins, and they're in. They got a six and a half game lead, but they haven't clinched yet. So they are going to be playing to win the game. You play to win the game, as I heard once. This National League is going to be quite interesting, other than the West, where the like the Dodgers have 106 wins already. Remember last year, everybody was freaking out because they had 100. Six and we're in the wild card. The Dodgers have 106 games. The record is 116 from 2001. Do they win 10 more games and tie the record? Do they win 11 and beat the record? Winning a World Series is way more important than that record, but they're going to want to win every game going in. Unfortunately, guys are going to get rested, all that stuff. The pool holes thing will be quite interesting to, to watch down the stretch for sure because um, just a, a really interesting chase. How high can he get? Can you imagine if he got even close to Babe Ruth, how exciting those few games would be. And then what does Judge do? Two home runs in the last 10 games. I thought Boston pitched him fairly. What is, how is Toronto? Going to pitch Aaron Judge. Keep in mind, Toronto is trying to win. They are trying to get home field advantage. Kevin Gossman on the hill tonight. 
against the Yankees. Don't know who's uh, starting tomorrow yet. Jameson Talon is starting for the Yankees. And then on Wednesday, uh, Garrett Cole for the Yankees. And still TBA uh, for the Blue Jays. So this is the time of the year where you can get really screwed in uh, fantasy baseball. If you're in the playoffs and a team is trying to get ready for the playoffs. Playoffs? And they start moving the rotation around, you might miss a start. You might miss a two-start guy. So you really, really have to be paying attention at this time of the year uh, to make sure that you're not getting screwed. All right. It is time to play a little Fantasy Thunderdome. We have a little fun on this show with this segment. Welcome to another edition of Thunderdome! You'd be cocky and arrogant even when you're getting beat. Two men enter, one man leaves. Prediction? Yes, prediction. Hey, and right now, I've got two men. It's serious. It is serious. Uh, We take... Fantasy Thunderdome, very, very serious here on Ultimate Fantasy Sports Daily. So, thought we'd do something a little bit different, and this is definitely for fantasy football, GMs, Dynasty Leagues, uh, certainly in the UFAFL, you're going to want to know about this. I am asking you, who do you like? when it comes to quarterbacks. Is it Bryce Young or is it C.J. Stroud? Fantasy Thunderdome means two players enter and one leaves. So who would you leave the 2023 NFL draft with if you had the first choice of quarterback. I I, I don't know if this is going to be a quarterback first overall draft. I haven't dove that deep into it. But who would you walk away from the NFL draft with if you had the choice? Bryce Young, CJ Stroud. Chime in on our Twitch chat. And we will let you have your say. Arnie saying Ryan Ufko is coming in Nashville. Been following him since uh, the Chicago Steel days. He's in the NCAA. So I think Danto, Dante is close to done there if he doesn't start showing more. I totally agree, Arnie. You know, going back to some hockey talk, I totally agree that this is this is the the year for Dante Fabro to like if if he starts in that top pairing. This, is a, this could be the last time you see it if he doesn't show anything and, you know, possibly uh, he gets dealt. We'll see. But I agree. I think it's put up or shut up time for Dante Fabro in Nashville. But who do you like when it comes to, to two ta- the 2023 quarterback class? These two guys, CJ Stroud, Bryce Young. Who do you like? going into the 2023 draft, and more importantly, who would you like to walk away with at that draft? Chime in on Twitch or hit me up on Twitter, at Duck Millard or at UFS Network. Welcome to another edition of Thunderdome! You'd be cocky and arrogant even when you're getting beat. Two men enter, one man leaves. Addiction? Yes, prediction. Hey, and right now, I've got two men. It's serious. Indeed, serious stuff here on Ultimate Fantasy Sports Daily. Um, Taking a look at uh, some of the uh, week three. uh, No, there it is. Lamar Jackson, and Jamie Thomas is going to talk about him. uh, But just uh, another brilliant performance. From the former MVP uh, that some people thought should have been a receiver. But this is uh, incredible. Five touchdowns from Lamar Jackson. 18 of 29, just 218 yards. Four touchdowns and an interception, and then carries one in. Lamar Jackson 
is the like the, the the price tag for Lamar Jackson is just increasing. I don't know what the Ravens are doing. But every game he keeps upping it. Like he controlled that game and he threw less than 30 passes. He can throw the ball, but he was just so accurate. Obviously, he's got the big tight end, Mark Andrews, who went up and got one in the end zone. Josh Oliver and uh, Devin DuVernay uh, were the other two. Nine total touchdowns in the last two weeks for Lamar Jackson. Like, I think he was pretty motivated after Tua and the Dolphins came back last week. How about Jalen Hurts? Now, Lamar Jackson put up 40.4 points. Jalen Hurts put up 27.6 points. The number three quarterback in fantasy right now. And I think I said something last week on bold predictions. I think I said Jalen Hurts is going to throw three touchdowns. Jalen Hurts, 22 of 35, 304 yards and three passing touchdowns. For the guy that was saying all he can do is run, he throws three touchdowns. No picks, and he did rush the ball 20 yards, just didn't get into the end zone. So in my touchdown-only league, he gets me a nice, solid 12 points, four points per passing touchdown. I love it when he runs them in because they're worth more, but Jalen Hurts is starting to flex that arm a little bit and starting to say, like, when you're talking about all those quarterbacks and all those legends, don't forget to start putting me in that category. I'm not saying he's going to finish this well, but actually I do think Jalen Hurts will finish as a top five quarterback. I don't know if he'll be top three, but I think Jalen Hurts can finish as a top five uh, quarterback in the NFL. How about Josh Allen? 26.7 points. Um, Didn't win the game. And didn't uh, put up more than... Uh, 17 points, but did have 42 completions. <laughs> Are you kidding me? 42 of 63 pass attempts for 400 yards and two touchdowns. He also carried the ball for 47 yards. Wow! This is like a crazy week. So even though the defense has held them to, I showed that stat the other day or earlier. 19 points was the highest between Mahomes, uh, Rodgers, uh, Allen, and uh, Brady. Some of these guys still got their fantasy points, even though their teams lost and didn't put up more than 19 points. Josh Allen still came through for the Buffalo Bills and for fantasy GMs. And Trevor Lawrence had a 25-plus game uh, as well. 28 of 39, 262, three touchdowns. And he uh, rushed for seven more yards as they beat the Chargers. So, you know, I, I know a lot of people, I think, have some concerns about just Jacksonville in general. Uh, but Trevor Lawrence, not bad. The biggest stat for Joe Burrows that you should be happy about if you have Joe Burrows is that he was only sacked twice in that contest. So it looks like Cincinnati might actually uh, have figured out the protection. He's off social media and he's protected. Now the Bengals who won can rev it up and get back into things. Um, all right, uh, just uh, looking. Yeah, it was against the Jets, but whatever. It's still a victory, and it's still something that you can build upon. All right, when we return, second hour of the show, Jamie Thomas of Jets Radio is going to join us. I'm, I'm just looking on TV at the uh, Ken Dorsey snap show. It was so good. And also, when we come back, We are going to preview the New Jersey Devils in our Dauber Hockey double shot of team previews today. Some really good young pieces, some nice veteran pieces. What do the Devils have in store for fantasy GMs this year? This is Ultimate Fantasy Sports Daily 
on the Ultimate Fantasy Sports Network. We're back right after this. Alrighty, it is just after 5 p.m. in uh, the East, and uh, I think uh, Ken Dorsey is still upset. Let's check in with him. Yep, yep, still still breaking tablets. Okay, we'll check back later with, oh, let's check. Uh, nope, nope, still. Still not having a good day is uh, Ken Dorsey. Offensive coordinator for the Bills. I, I you know... Josh Allen still had an amazing day. They still had a chance to win. They, they screwed up on that. Uh, they tried to pull the Dan Marino, the fake spike, and then throw to Diggs, and they almost got picked. Wouldn't that have been something? He, he might have been throwing stuff out the, the window of the press box if that was the case. Thanks for uh, being a part of the show with me today. My name is Dean Millard. We will have Jamie Thomas of Jets Radio and the executive director of our Twitch channel. He will join us uh, on the show in about uh, 16 minutes time or so, uh, but just got a good note. And I love, uh, I love everybody in our Telegram group uh, for UFHL. They're always up to date. And Arnie uh, pointing out that the Arizona Coyotes have sent Connor Geeky back to the Winnipeg Ice, which is not surprising. Um, I, I will be honest. I watched the ice last year several times and not, not a scout by any means. But I didn't come away impressed in any of the games that I, I watched. And I, I think uh, this is a year that Connor Geeky and, and Matthew Savoy are really going to take a step forward. And getting Geeky back to his WHL team early uh, is a good thing, I think. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that's happening. And Alexander Suzdalev has been sent back to the Regina Pats, according to uh, Arnie as well. So uh, Arnie's like our uh, WHL insider here. He's giving us all the goods, but th that's huge for the Regina Pats and Connor Bedard, who uh, scored a couple on opening night, uh, or Saturday night anyway, against uh, Moose Jaw. Just such a lethal shot. But they get the Washington Capitals third rounder back. I still, still don't see Regina having enough or being able to acquire enough to make a run. So not the way the West is uh, look, and, and even Moose Jaw. Like, Regina's not even better than Moose Jaw right now. They're not better than Winnipeg. They're not better than Moose Jaw. I don't know if they're better than Red Deer. They got a lot of work to do with Connor Bedard. And I'd love for them to do it and go and go deep because I want Connor Bedard needs to play in the World Juniors, and the CHL would love to have him in the Memorial Cup. He's going to play in the World Juniors for sure. 
Will he play in the Memorial Cup? That's something the Canadian Hockey League uh, would love. Tony loves the uh, Ken Dorsey video. How about those Dolphins? Jamie will be in a good mood today. I would hope so. He was in Edmonton last night, so he's going to be in a really good mood. Jets uh, lost 4 nothing in preseason. But anyway, that's a little bit of news from the uh, hockey world. Lots of guys are being sent back all over the place. Uh, we will definitely try to keep you up to date on all of that. But right now, let's get to our second. It's a double shot of Dauber hockey today. It's the Dauber hockey preview of the New Jersey Devils. Oh, man, I should have had the putty clip. How did I not have putty lined up? We're the Devils. Nobody beats us. Ah! Maybe my favorite Seinfeld moment. So we're looking at the New Jersey Devils. Uh, obviously a team that has been drafting fairly high lately. Um I'm not sure what to think of the Devils yet. Uh, they have obviously some really high-end talent. They, they, you know, they go out and they bring in a guy like Palat. They have Dougie Hamilton. They have Damon Siversen. But the rest of the team is really young. Eric Howla's veteran, Thomas Tatar, has played you know a few seasons. But this is going to be like Hamilton, Palat, and a bunch of kids. That's what it seems like. I don't think they're a playoff team when it comes to the NHL. Playoffs? But certainly they can help you make the playoffs in your fantasy league. Jack Hughes, stud. And this, in a dynasty league, this is a guy who, uh, if it's a redraft league and, and he hasn't been drafted, then that's crazy. Um, but I'm looking at Hughes, Jesper Bratt, and Dougie Hamilton. Those are the top three fantasy stars. I think the point production for Hamilton, I think he's going to be a 50-plus point guy. But the Palat signing... They needed something, you know, and there it, it was a bonus that obviously Tampa just couldn't do it anymore. They had to let somebody go. And he, I think he could really help Jack Hughes and Jesper Bratt come along as young players. Dawson Mercer. Is this guy have 20 goals in him this year? Igor Shangarovich. Does that guy have 20 goals this year? And what of Nico Heischer? I mean, a second line. Like, here, here's what Dauber Hockey has. Actually, I'll, I'll get to Nico Heischer is my breakout player because I'm still waiting for him to break out. And Damon Severson is my sleeper. He's going to play behind Dougie Hamilton. And he might outpoint him. So let's take a look at what Dauber Hockey uh, has going when it comes to the Devils. So they have Jack Hughes and Brad, both 70 plus points uh, and a couple of, and one 30 goal scorer on the team. That's why they're not making the playoffs. You're only having, you know, one 30 and then a bunch of 20s. You need like nine 20s and they only have a, a couple of uh, forecasted. But this is a team depending on where you are in your fantasy hockey team build, are you rebuilding? Then target these guys. Like Alexander Holtz on a third line, this guy has 40 goal potential. He's still young, but he will be available in your leagues. In a dynasty league, this is a team... Jack Hughes is already on your league, probably. Jasper Bratt, I'm sure. Guys like Dawson and Nico, he sure probably will be as well. Guys like Dawson Mercer, Alexander Holtz, uh, Sharon Govich. These are guys that could be really strong players in a couple of years. Maybe even next year. Maybe even halfway through this year. 
that's maybe pushing it. But an interesting group with a bunch of kids. I mean, the Devils have to be one of the youngest teams in the NHL. Have to be one of the youngest teams in the National Hockey League. But it's going to be an interesting situation. What happens in goal? I haven't even talked about that. Is Vanacek the guy? Is it going to be Vanacek gets upwards of 45 games? Or is it going to be Mackenzie Blackwood steals some gate? Oh, or uh, is, is Blackwood uh, hurt? I thought maybe I'm thinking of somebody else right now. But anyway, Vanasek is going to be an interesting situation to watch uh, when it comes to, to the Devils. Again, I don't think this is a playoff team, but I like a lot of these young players. Uh, and I, I think, you know, the Devils have a pretty crowded right wing when you've got a guy in Alexander Holtz and his potential on the third line. Maybe somebody gets moved. I think I like Holtz more than I like Mercer, but that's tough. We will see, you know, definitely uh, some movement. Like I said, with the Nashville Predators, there's opportunity there. And some of these guys need some line luck too. Like Thomas Tatar easily can slide up if uh, Sharon Govich isn't going. Same with Holtz and Mercer. Those two guys could be interchangeable all year. Like, I think the, the top line is, is pretty secure, other than the odd shuffle here and there. But Palat, with a couple of young guys to, to really mentor them, is, is pretty good. I don't see Nico Heischer getting supplanted by Eric Howla uh, on the uh, second-line center position. But it's those two wing positions, kind of like Nashville. Second and third line can be a little bit interchangeable. If you are going for somebody, I, I would be going for Holtz, Mercer, Rather than Thomas Tatar, I, you know, obviously I think there's a lot more upside with Holtz and Mercer. But there's some, there's some interesting potential uh, with this uh, particular roster moving forward. You know, a guy we didn't even talk about is uh, Fabian Sederland. So that, some time away though. Jonathan Bernier underwent hip surgery last January. Uh, doesn't seem ready for the start of the season, which is why they went out and got Vanacek. So Vanacek and, and Wedgwood, hmm, not... Not a goaltending tandem that I would be crazy about in the NHL or in fantasy. So I kind of look at the uh, I kind of look at the Predators and the Devils a little bit similar, especially when it comes to the second line. Now, I think the Predators are a much better hockey team and will be a uh, much bigger contender to make the playoffs and, and, and I'm sure will make the, uh, the playoffs. So, uh, interesting uh, looks at, at two teams kind of going in different directions. You know, the Predators are a contender. The Devils are you know, not going to make the playoffs. But they have similar situations where some guys need a little line luck. And... Some guys can be interchanged on that second and, and third line, and I think you will see that um, quite a bit. Yeah, Arnie says they're going with uh, Vitek, Vanacek, and Blackwood because Bernier is out, as, as I just mentioned. That's not that good. That's the area, you know, their, their first line, solid for fantasy. Second line has some options. Third line, depends how deep your league are, your league is, rather. Uh, the right side of the blue line I really like with Hamilton and, and Severson, and I don't like the goaltending. 
Tony says New Jersey isn't even in the top 10 youngest teams. How is that possible? Their roster looks like a daycare. Jeez. Well, I guess maybe they did get Palat and Hamilton in the last little bit that brought the age up. But, man, they really look like a, a bunch of kids. It's a bunch of fun, exciting kids. And I don't mean kids in any kind of derogatory term, term at all. Just young. And they, they seem like they're crazy young when you look at some of those guys. Uh, although some of those guys have been in the uh, AHL for a few years, so maybe they're just young in terms of NHL experience, maybe. That's maybe not age. Holtz has been around uh, for, for in the AHL, so maybe it's NHL experience. Uh, they, are, they have to be one of the most inexperienced teams, but uh, I would have thought they would have been one of the younger teams as well, but that certainly uh, has surprised me. All right, so that's a look at the New Jersey Devils, uh, the second of our double shot for our Dauber Hockey previews. When we get back, we're going to duck out for a short break. Jamie Thomas is going to join us. How good was his day yesterday? He got to fly to Edmonton, watch the Dolphins win, and then watch preseason hockey. Does it get any better than preseason sports? Does it get any worse than preseason sports? We're back in just a second.
5.21 p.m. Eastern Time, 3.21 in uh, the West where I'm located. Thanks very much uh, for being a part of Ultimate Fantasy Sports Daily here on uh, the Ultimate Fantasy Sports Network. Um, Talking about the Devils, uh, I thought they would easily be one of the youngest teams. Tony says two teams are tied at 25... Point nine years. And I thought the Devils would be under 26, says Arnie. And um, I'm trying to find... Sabres and Blue Jackets are two of the younger teams. Detroit, New Jersey. Oh, so, yeah. I was right. Tony's trying to trick me up here. Get me to say the wrong stuff. Devils are the fourth youngest team. So, yeah, I thought... Uh, it, seemed like they were way too young uh, to not like unless they you know like brought in like a 70 year old to switch it around anyway let's uh bring in uh my good friend and yours mr jamie thomas uh who was uh in edmonton over the weekend watching some play or preseason hockey <laughs> not playoff hockey not playoff hockey preseason hockey but that was not playoff hockey Oh, no. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Do you know what I just realized, though, man? What? You are so lucky because I just realized that this year, Halloween falls on a Monday. That means mm-hmm. you're going to get to see me in costume again. All right. Yeah. And I'm actually home for that one because we get back from Vegas, I think, the uh, on the Sunday. So cause I, I have to go trick-or-treating with my children. Or Sorry, I only have one trick-or-treating ch- child left, so... Um, the other two what? have bailed. Why? Like th- you made uh, them bail, or they bailed? No, they they're not they're not into it anymore. Oh. You know why though? Do you know you know why? Because um, they get a lot of candy, but Des takes it all away. She lets them have a whole bunch of stuff and then raids the bag. You know what I mean? So she's smart. Uh, I don't. I don't. It was totally smart. I'm not hopping my kids up on candy. So they have their. They have their great night. The first, the, the Halloween night. I'm sure they're digging into the bag while they're walking around getting the candy. And then Des is like, that's it. And then you get the one piece of candy every lunch, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, for a little bit, but then it's usually me and Des that eats the candy. That's, yeah, so. They don't know that. It's us that eats <laughs> they it all the time. They yeah. know. They know that we eat the candy. So. They do? Okay. Your kids are smarter um, so, than I So was. Maxim and Evan, you're like, oh, we're out. I'm not doing this for you. I'm not, I'm not hustling candy for <laughs> <Yeah>. you. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not being your candy mule. Like, you guys go get your own candy. I'm not doing all the hard work here. Yeah. You go get your own candy. Yeah, you oh. go to you put on the costume that look ridiculous as adults go trick or treating. Because I think I think Jerry Seinfeld that one stand up like how old do you have to stop being right. trick or treating? That's and what there's I was always that old. There's always that late group of kids because I remember in Cochrane they'd always come about nine o'clock looking for candy all the time. And you're looking, I'm like, are you a little too old for this? But then I get it because you, you want candy. So, Honestly, I trick or treated in high school because I just wanted yeah. more candy. That's right. So you can't blame them for it, but my kids aren't into it. So I don't know. But is there, it's, what they should do is put on a costume not and tell us they're going to a friend's house and go trick-or-treating. Yeah. Don't tell you. And don't tell me. And then, oh, no, you, I lied to you about going trick-or-treating. Like, it's just, it's they never even you know. Really... You would never <laughs> even know because they just no. keep the candy at their friend's house. That's, see? We're coming up with great ideas for them. And we I need to go back kids... and be kids again. Why didn't we I, think I know, of these like, things? We have great ideas that none of them are for the benefit of mankind. That's just the whole thing. So yeah. they've gone to waste as adults. Yeah. Well, uh, don't worry. Yeah. I'm going to dress up for you. Just just for Thanks, you, buddy. I'm going to dress up on uh, Halloween. Because you know I love it. You know I love uh, it. So I want I want to dress up so bad now because I see all the costumes that are out there, which yeah, we clearly did not have as kids. You And that's another Seinfeld thing. We had that crappy mask with the two staples on the side of the mask with the little one hole in there. And Seinfeld talks about you can't even breathe with those things yeah. on. And I, I don't know. Your, my favorite costume was um, one of my brother's friends was Wilson from um, what's Tim What's Tim the Tool Man Taylor? Oh, yeah, what's that yeah, show yeah. Again? I know. Uh, tool uh, Time. Home tool Improvement. Time. Yeah. Home Improvement. Home Improvement. And he was actually, he had actually a fence in front of his face this high That's up good. and had a hat on. Except he couldn't, my brother said he couldn't sit down at the bar because he, he had the fence in front of him so he couldn't bend his legs which is a great costume and then my brother was a can of kokanee that year and i'm like your friend rolls out as wilson 
and you're a can of coke in you, so you only put a garbage can around himself. Like that's you got outshone that day, yeah. my son. <laughs> you know, like everything that we were as kids, like at least yeah. for me, I grew up in Brandon. So whatever yeah. I was, I was the fat version of it because it was always so cold. <laughs> so if I was a ninja, I was the fat ninja. Totally. I, was like Chris, I was like Chris Farley, Beverly Hills Ninja. Oh, I'm a stormtrooper. Yeah. I'm the fat stormtrooper because yeah. you got to wear parkas underneath. So, you know, I was like really skinny as a kid, but every costume yeah. was fat guy costume because you had to wear so many you clothes. You had to wear your coat. You had to wear your coat and my mom one year i was the incredible hulk and my mom used her pantyhose <laughs> on my arms for the muscles and she put paper we crumpled up paper for my muscles nice. like see kids don't even know the the suffering that we went through because that was such an embarrassing costume to wear yeah. uh i got my mom's pantyhose on my arms <laughs> to cut off like this like <laughs> Our parents Horrible tried. Stuff. They tried, but yeah. we just we didn't have the resources. It was a different world. We didn't have internet. We didn't even have the, we like we had to go into the no. encyclopedia and look up our yeah. costume. Like there was no yeah. let like, Google a costume. Yeah, what should we do? How do we put this together? No, yeah. there's none of that. It was it was your mom's creativeness, <laughs> which you have to love your mom for right. you for do. going through. A, but in classic kid form, you don't appreciate it at all. You're just like you're just more worried about what your friends are gonna think. And then you have your costume on, you get your big parka on, and you're like, all they see is your mask. Yeah. And no one knows who you are because your costume's covered up because of our yeah. coats. We, we Halloween had, on we, the prairies. The, the struggle was real, man. The struggle yeah. was real. I'm, I've, I saw a lot of therapists about it. That's, yeah, uh, that's I'm right. still seeing. I'm still Me going too. to therapy about all Me the too. trauma. On, oh, on Halloween, Halloween trauma. <laughs> Halloween trauma. Okay. Um, if you had only tried harder. <laughs> that's right. If you only had better <laughs> craft have, skills. <laughs> I might have turned into something, you know. Like it's like it's, this is See, all the genesis of I my always, failure. And I always got Derek and Darren's costume, whatever they were like the year oh. before. I was like, this sucks, man. Anyway, Buddy, let's, as as a, as the third kid, it must suck because you it get did all suck, the yeah. hand me downs. Yeah, you get everything. Like, every everything's worn through. That's right. Every, Twice though, because they were twins. Like they were twins, yeah. so it would go through one twin, then the other twin, then me. So yeah. like there was three yes. holes, there was like uh, like three pant legs and everything because there's holes in everything, so it's terrible. We have First like a problems. full, uh, we have a full cupboard here full of Evania's old clothes, and Evania's like four years older than Esme, so Esme's getting like four year old clothes. Right. By the time she get, by the time she's ten, it's like it's been it's been in this drawer. Like who knows how many moths are gonna come out of the drawer when we open that up? So yeah, there's like a, probably like a yeah. Chip and Pepper shirt in there or something. That's how yeah. old it's gonna be or something like that. Last last ridiculous thing. Did you ever have that um, shirt that with uh, would it what fed off your heat on your body and it would? Uh, I can't remember what company yeah, was like that was, but it, it would tie dye, right? Like it would, yeah, 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 like yeah. It would heat up. But I had one of those because I worked at Randy River, and my armpits like just always. We're just huge. So it's like it was never it wasn't even sweat. It was just a complete like it, whatever the whatever the brightest color of that thing was, that would be my armpits. It would just like shine up to my shoulders. Oh. I, I wore that shirt like four times and it just got ridiculed by my friends. So I was just of course. that one into the garbage. So like I think it was like forty bucks, even with my Randy River discount. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Let's get to some fantasy football talk. And like, we sure. haven't even got to the butt punt yet, and we're already oh laughing. God. But oh, yesterday, no. these are the three things that Jamie Thomas learned uh, from week three in the NFL. Yeah. Let's start with Jalen Hurts, right? I, I know you love this. You have him in our yes. touchdown only league, and I, I know you don't reap the benefits as much. And you and I had this huge debate last year because I put up the, t the front runners for MVP. Um, all his rushing yards and stuff goes to waste in our touchdown league. But I, I, I looked this. I saw this on uh, Monday Morning Quarterback Week Two versus this is first half stats from Jalen Hurts, seventeen to twenty for two hundred fifty one yards to a touchdown. That was against Minnesota. And week Three versus are on the road against Washington. This is the first half again, eighteen of twenty seven for two hundred seventy nine yards and three touchdowns. Yeah. So they're just yeah, the Eagles are like a fantasy team's dream right now outside of the running back situation. Um, it is he is Jalen Hurts is unreal and. I love these guys, and I know we're going to talk about Lamar Jackson in a second, but I just, these, the running slash the, del, the dual threat quarterback, I love them. They're great for fantasy football, but I just love all this stuff of like, oh, I don't know if Jalen Hurts can do this. Yeah. Uh, Lamar Jackson, oh, blah, blah, blah. Why is he doing this? And we you know we've already talked about Lamar Jackson and is, you know, not re and representing himself and is probably hurting himself in that situation, but they are great for the game. They're fast. There's not many of them. 
And I just, I, it, it blows my mind that people just want to like constantly tear them apart for what they are and what they provide and which is excitement every Sunday, Monday or Thursday, whatever, when want to look at it. But Jalen Hurst and the Eagles are for real, man. And they are uh, lighting it up because of the excellent play from Jalen Hurts. And um, I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled to say it. It's just, it's something you want to go with. And then number two, I really thought, I really thought the Dolphins playing at, at home against uh, Bills, you know, the Buffalo Bills. I'm like, okay, yeah, they've had these two wins, and it was impressive the comeback against uh, Baltimore. But Miami continues to give up. Before the game against Buffalo, I believe they're giving up 8.3 yards per passing play. And then, of course, you know, they go for uh, through over 400 um, for, the, for the Buffalo Bills. And, like, it just – it's ridiculous. Josh Allen. I have a lot of things going on in my head right now. I'm talking about fan, our, our Halloween costumes, but Josh Allen goes over 400 yards, but 60 something plus passes. Yeah. The fact that they they Buffalo kept shooting themselves in the foot, I, I know that and I get that part, but some of that has to be on Miami, and some part of this is the Dolphins' defense. And I know the the Bills were on the field for extensive periods of time. I know the heat was a factor. I know the injuries were a factor, but good teams find a way to win those games. And I'm not taking – the Bills are going to be – they are a Super Bowl candidate, no question about it. But this is a huge win for the Dolphins, um, no question about it, because I think a lot of people, including myself, were going, I don't know. Like, I thought they were going to get killed by a Buffalo. I thought there was just no way. I know the Bills flew in a little bit earlier to get used to the heat, like New England did, but it just – they were just better than, on this day and, and shut, locked it down when they had to. So uh, the, the Miami Dolphins, at, as of week number three – are for real in the National Football League. Do I put them in a Super Bowl category yet? No, but I'm still more than happy to say they'll be a, a playoff team. Yeah, they're the only undefeated team in the AFC. So weird. I, I was it's not... Just, it's a weird time. It, and yesterday's game is weird in the context of, you know, the Dolphins won the game, but the yeah. Bills provided much more fantasy uh, oh, uh, yeah. points and things. I mean... Josh Allen, Tyree 400 Hill's yards, nothing. throwing the ball. 60. Yeah, yeah. Tyreek Hill, what the heck happened? with Ty- you, had, you had Waddle and Hill last week setting a record, and, and Jalen yeah. Waddle still got the, the, the ball thrown to him over 100 yards. Yeah. But what the heck happened with Tyreek Hill? So it was a weird game that way because the Bills provided more fantasy, but the Dolphins won the actual game. Right, and Chase Edmond gets two more touchdowns, like barely any rushing yards on top yeah, of that. Yeah, 21 goal. yards. And Buffalo... Buffalo had incredible amounts of injuries in their secondary. They had a lot of rookies, a lot of inexperienced guys in there. So I thought Tyreek Hill was going to tear them apart. But you have to give Buffalo credit, man. They, they, they still did all the things to lock down a very dangerous Miami Dolphins offense. Uh, we're not going to go into the two-tongue of the law uh, situation because I, we have no idea. You know, the Dolphins are saying one thing. The league's, the NFLPA wants to look into the concussion protocol that was followed and stuff like that. But I, all I know is when I saw the video of him getting up, I'm like, oh, man, that that's a concussion. They're claiming there was a, his back froze up. I, I yeah, I've never had my back freeze. So it's just it's just so hard, right? And, and it's so hard to look at it. It's it's going to be very hard for the league and the NFLPA to prove that there was something wrong that they didn't follow the concussion protocol. So we'll have to see how that goes. But um, you know, you're gonna ha- you have to look at it though, right? Like they at least have yeah, to look oh, at this. Yeah, they they do. Yes, and it, and it it looks suspicious. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I've never. And we've gone over that before too. It's just it's hard to tell where the real real side of the story is coming from. So, mm. nonetheless, uh, NFLPA and all of these, this investigation coming up, we'll see how this this turns out. But I do hope that they follow concussion protocol because Tua is is looking what they thought he was going to be, and it'd be really unfortunate and sad if they didn't uh, you know stay with that. Especially when you start the season two and zero. Oh, I don't really think that you had to have that game, so I really hope you're not putting somebody in the in harm's way just to go to three and zero. Right. Uh, and yeah. You mentioned Lamar Jackson, four touchdowns yeah. yesterday, five in total when you count uh, on the ground. Uh, yeah. Didn't didn't throw the ball a lot for a lot nope. of yards, but just so accurate. Like this is a guy who yeah. said they said, oh, uh, he can can he throw? He's got a strong arm. Is it accurate? Yeah. He's just he's just shutting everybody up. He's like checking every box. Yeah, and I remember, you know, when he was back in college, I was like, I don't know, I don't know, this guy's going to be this, this next real thing. And, I, and then, you know, slides in the draft to the last part of it. And I mean, I believe it was the last pick of the draft in the first round. But and a great, great call by the Baltimore Ravens. But, again, another guy that is electric every Sunday and maybe he's not your pr- prototypical quarterback that stands in the pocket and everything, but who cares? You just need every, you need something different throughout the league someplace. So I enjoy thoroughly anytime. And, yes, sometimes he mail, airmails passes. 
and stuff like that. But it's just there's just the unique skill set that he has and the ability that he's learned over time to not put himself in harm's way as much as he does run. Uh, it's an incredible testament to him as, as staying as healthy as he has. I know his career has been very short. It's still early on, but uh, impressive nonetheless. And uh, the Baltimore Ravens and Lamar Jackson have to come to some type of agreement here, <laughs> you would hope, um, uh, without those those uh, these those sneaky agent fees that are going on here. But I'm, I'm telling you, if he had an agent, this, this thing would have been done a long time ago. Yeah, like this price keeps going up, and I, like Baltimore yeah. at some point is going to have to fish or cut bait because like yeah. th- th- somebody's going to pay this guy uh, every time he goes out. And, and you know, even against Miami when they lost, he wasn't bad. Just yeah. two of no, them were really good. So like this guy is getting better and better. He bet on himself just like Aaron Judge did, and it looks like yeah. at, right now at least he's he's you know it's going well because somebody's going to throw a lot of money at him or he's going to get franchised, right? Right. Yeah, and, and I. It would be silly for Baltimore to cut away from him because you've built yeah. the offense around him. So I, I don't – like it's just the, the marriage is there. The marriage is working. So let's just come to a conclusion here. You're going to have to pay a lot of money um, flat out. I, I, I understand that you don't want to pay Josh Allen money. I understand you don't want to pay Patrick Mahomes money. But this is the market and the world that yeah. we live in right now. So yeah. um, it, I, I know it makes it challenging um, salary cap-wise down the road. But, man, with the way television contracts are going, you know, Amazon paid $1 billion a year for the rights of Thursday Night Football. I think they're going to be okay in Baltimore with the way the salary cap goes up and, and the like like that. So yeah. hopefully this comes around. But as long as Lamar Jackson keeps entertaining us every Sunday and making fantasy owners happy, it's a good place to live in. I, I would agree. I, I don't like paying a buck thirty-five a liter for gas either, but it's the no. unfortunate world that I live in as well. And I know oh, you guys yeah. are a little bit more out in uh, Manitoba. All right, let's talk some baseball now. Uh, two things about baseball that you really enjoyed uh, or yeah. are, are learning about over the weekend. Right. Um, okay. So Albert Pujols gets the seven hundred fourth player ever in history to do so. But I just like the the lot the. This doesn't begin to explain the greatness of Albert Pujols because I know it's only the seventh player to do it, but he's on the road in L.A. You know, St. Louis crushes the Dodgers that night. I believe he hits two home runs, 699-700. The fact that he got a huge standing ovation, and you should. I'm not saying any fan base shouldn't do this, but he gets a huge standing ovation. Mookie Betts is like clapping in the outfield. You, you see Dave Roberts reacting yeah. and realizing he shouldn't be reacting, but it's just an exciting moment for a guy who's such a good player, a great player, a classy player, and the things that he does for his, you know, his home country, you know, you can't even put together and explain to how incredible this, this individual is. It's, it's sad that this is, well, it, it looks like this is going to be it for him, um, but the fact that he got to 700, you know, and we were everybody's tuning in again. I, it is not like when it was with Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. And we're all tuning in every night to see the home run, but you sure were interested. And the St. Louis Cardinals are a good team. Dodgers are a great team, but it's just the fact that we were and tuning in. Oh, did Albert Pujols get that? That's good for the sport, mm-hmm. and it's great for an individual because of the person that he is. So really happy for Albert Pujols. Special player, special person. Yeah, I, I totally agree, man. Uh, great dude. And, and I love that it happened in L.A. where he said uh, the yeah. fans helped him fall in love with the game again. So that that is great. I was I was at the Oil King game on Friday night, and I was watching Judge uh, uh, on his uh, quest. And then when that ended, I watched Pujols uh, hit his two dingers. So it was quite fun. And, and I am, I, I'm tuning in uh, every night. I've got... Uh, judge on uh, every night and you know we're we're looking at that and 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 that's your next point the jays can send a message uh to the yankees and to everybody but also they could be part of history too with with this uh aaron judge chase so it's a real fun time for a blue jays fan right as he as he continues to try and break the american league record right held by roger maris uh all the way and you can argue about all the other stuff with sammy sosa and mark mcguire and barry bonds and the steroids all that stuff but Still, it, the fact that, that in a year that a guy bets on himself a, in the probably the team in Major League Baseball, it's just like it just it's a great time. It's it, it, it's fun to watch, and but it's 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 huge for the Blue Jays, right? Um, mm-hmm. Kevin Gossman goes tonight against Luis Severino. You you got a great pitching match. I know the Jays have announced their starters for Tuesday and Wednesday at this point. But, man, like, if you can take two or three from this series and it, you end up running up against these guys in the playoffs, it's just, it's good for a young team to have this. The, the Yankees are also young. 
it's just a great matchup and you want this rivalry to come back alive. And if the Jays can do this on home turf and excite the fans and it's been a great year for both teams, like this is a, is a tremendous opportunity for the Jays to just kind of send a message to the Yankees that, you know, we're not going to back down from you. They crawled all the way back into the race again while the Yankees fell had their slide. So it's just, there's all kinds of good things going on right now for the Toronto Blue Jays and, what a time to uh, run into the New York Yankees uh, on home turf. It's going to be really, really, really cool. Oh, right, my uh, gosh. Yeah, like, lastly. Just, like, much more TV. Yeah, it's, 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 it is. it's It really is. And, and all the way through to October. And then, like, this is the best time. you got all four sports about to be colliding. Um, yeah. so, so it's really great. Now, uh, college football. All, you know, maybe not as uh, much upheaval uh, this past weekend as we've yeah. seen in, in the first two, but you got your eyes on Kansas. Yeah, and why not? Um, you, you, I saw the stat today. Kansas hasn't finished better than three and nine in thirteen years. They're four and zero. Oh. So wow. I mean, and then for them, for them to climb into the top twenty-five um, is a tremendous, a tremendous feat, right? And you, you know, you and I are the, we love the underdog. We love this this story. Um, they've got Iowa State this weekend. They're three and one. Uh, Kansas four and zero. But for them to crawl in and get more wins, you know, in their first four games than they've had in over thirteen years is fantastic. So that's my uh, thing to watch and thing I've learned over the weekend in college football. And and, and again, we we talked about uh, you know, Kentucky in the past. Kansas is another school that's more known for basketball and making a name for themselves uh, in football. So that's fun to see. Yeah, absolutely. And our good friends, Appalachian State. So it's just like we uh, we are it's all coming up roses for Dean Millard and Jamie Thomas in our pursuit of the, and, and cheering for the little guy. How how fun did you just not want that preseason game to ever end last night? Like the first uh, of eight, right? You guys play eight. Does everybody play eight? No, they are only playing six. So the Oilers are playing only eight. I don't know what the thought process behind the six and eight uh, game oh, okay. thing or whatever, but yeah, it's it's completely bizarre to me. But I'm thrilled. Should be four. Uh, here, here's the thing. I think we all know who's going to make the Jets. Like, there's just not there's not really much. There, there might be somebody that come in there that comes sure. in there and comes to the 13th forward or the seventh defenseman that we we didn't think of. We already know who the goaltenders are. We have a pretty good idea who the, all the forwards are going to be. I already have the idea who the first three lines are. So it's just not much mystery here. No. But it, you you do love seeing the younger players. Like Chaz Lucius played last night. That was his yeah. first NHL game outside of the, 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 pen, the tournament Penticton. First, first round pick in 2021. You know, other guys are going to get chances. And it's exciting for them. So I think we have to – like I, there was grumbling about preseason hockey. It's always messy. But man, it's still an NHL game for the younger guys. And after being in Penticton, you start to re- you, you start to under- you get to know the guys, the younger players a little bit better, and you realize how exciting this whole process is. So I, I think um, I've I've come to appreciate preseason hockey more than I have in years past because of what it means to the younger players. And it's a great opportunity for guys in the in the Manitoba that will play at the Manitoba Moose, the American Hockey League, and all, all across the National Hockey League, to kind of put their foot in there, like Mikey Asamont is this gritty, grinding, diminutive forward who just doesn't you, – you see him every time he's on the ice. He's always doing something. So they're just – they want to put their foot in the door for Rick Bonus and his coaching staff whenever there's an injury, and there will be, who's going to be the first call-up or the second call-up. That's, that's, that's why these preseason games are so important. And while it's like – it's going through the process for you, likes of you and me and our other media friends – it is a whole lot different for the younger guys to play in the NHL or the American Hockey League. Yeah, I get that. But that you can get yeah. all, everything you just said oh. can be accomplished in four games. Like, I mean, dude, what team have you ever tried out for where you showed up and you didn't know the like three quarters of the team is already picked? Like every, minor hockey, I went to tryouts. I knew I wasn't making the team. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. You go to the WHL tryouts, you know, it's Connor Bedard isn't getting, you know, like all, every team at these levels are three quarters picked and you're looking for a few guys and I get, and you can do that in four games. I mean, the reason 100%. there's so many PTOs is because teams have to fill out veteran requirements. It's crazy. Yeah. I just, yeah. I just, I, I get the young guys trying to make an impression, but you can make an impression in two or three games and, th- and that's all you need. That I just think it's and, too much. And it's not like the, Preseason tickets are any cheaper, so people that don't normally go to games, like, make preseason cheaper so people that don't normally get to see the games can come to the games. That's not going to happen. I I just know. We know this. We just – it is mind-boggling. 
I'm sure the NHL feels they have other things, other fish to fry, but uh, I agree with you. Cut it to four. Play, play all the young kids the first two games. Give them a shot. Kind of let the guys are kind of yeah. on the cusp play that third game and then bring your full squad together for the fourth game and then you're off and running. We, we solved it. We solved it. We solved the NHL's problems. Yeah. Do you have any Very split squad games? Work. We're coming for you. Um, <laughs> Do you have split squad games? Yeah. And that wasn't Did, a threat. That was just uh, so we don't have that out there. <laughs> split squad I'm games not, are the worst. I'm not Chris Chelios. Yeah, <laughs> split squad right. games. <laughs> they suck. I'm not doing a Chris Chelios. Uh, split squad games are awful. So, yeah, they don't have any. No, they don't. Oh, so you're lucky. It'll be a younger, I believe it's a younger squad again tomorrow against Ottawa. Uh, Rick Bonus said a little bit more veteran presence game three. And by the time they get to Calgary uh, for game six, it'll be the full squad because the Jets are their Jets are heading to Banff for five days of team building before the regular season starts. So. Wow, do the broadcasters get to go? Mm, Paul Edmonds and I will be on the plane back to Winnipeg <laughs> on Saturday. <laughs> back to Winnipeg. D- did, you like, did you like the pause there? Yeah. <laughs> Paul Edmonds and I will be on the plane back to Winnipeg. Dramatic yeah, pause. So. Bravo. All right, Thanks buddy. a lot, man. I love, I love the new studio, man. I love it. Yeah, we're working hard on it. we got a few other yeah. things to do, but... Uh, we've yeah. got some new improvements, so I think it's going to look a lot better as we go. It works for the show, man. It works for the show. Thanks, buddy. Thank you so okay, much man. for joining me. As usual, we'll talk soon. Yeah, you bet. Okay, bye. There's Jamie Thomas of Jets Radio, and, of course, he's our executive director of the uh, Twitch channel. Uh, honestly, you guys might not like it, but Jamie and I could talk about the goofiest things forever. Not sure if it's the greatest thing for a show or not, but we'll see. Uh, just trying to catch up with the chat. I love Tony says, uh, comeback show how strong the locker room is and they weren't intimidated by the Bills. That, that's perfect. Like, that's that's exactly it. Like, you know, they held that team, that team in check. They, they let Josh Allen do whatever he wanted pretty much, but... That team was held in check. And that's a huge victory, you know, in seven weeks from now to look back on. Anyway, fun chat with Jamie Thomas. He'll join us every Monday here on uh, Ultimate Fantasy Sports Daily. We are going to wrap things up on the show. When we come back, we're back in just a few.
All right, 10 minutes before 6 o'clock here on Ultimate Fantasy Sports Daily. Thank you so much uh, for being a part of the show today and uh, every Monday to Friday, 4 Eastern to 6 Eastern, we are here uh, having some fun with uh, fantasy sports and more. If you were paying attention to the last segment, uh, Jamie and I can go on a bit of a tangent from some time to time. Uh, but let's uh, circle back to a couple of things. Uh, question of the day, who is the worst looking NFL team after almost three weeks as we have a game tonight? Monday Night Football, there will be a Twitch watch party right here on twitch.tv slash ultimate fantasy sports. So make sure you keep it Locked on here to have some fun with the National Football League. But who is the worst-looking team after three weeks? I, I said the Raiders, especially with the expectations I had. Not been fun. Has not been fun at all. And here's what I learned after almost three weeks. Uh, the defense holds the big four. Rodgers, Brady, Mahomes, and Allen, none of them put up more than 20 points. 19 was the total. Denver being 2-0 and is wild, but Nathaniel Hackett made some smart decisions yesterday. He didn't go for it when they came up short. On third down, he punted to because his defense was playing well, and then finally somehow the offense got going and went down to win the game. So I don't know. I don't know how they're doing it. They blew it in week one. They barely won week two. They brought in outside help in week three. And they're two and one. I did not think Denver would be two and one and and Vegas would be 0 and three. And the other thing we learned is that we definitely need more coach cams. This is Ken Dorsey. Just slam, like he can't, he's looking for stuff to slam. Like this literally was me at like 13. Steve Smith banks it in, this is me. Crushed. Glenn Wesley, over the net, that's me. We Kings lose to the Windsor Spitfires in the Memorial Cup, that's me. And that was only 11 years, 12 years ago. Anyway, Ken Dorsey, snap show for the Bills, who lost yesterday to the Miami Dolphins. So we need more of those. Also, if you want to give your project a big marketing boost, we have what you need. Get yourselves ready to race at great heights to become the global sim racing champion. Create your crypto livery. Enter with the best designs. Enter to win prizes. Outrace your competition. Winning is all that matters. Watch the other racers in your rear view mirror. Gain massive exposure battling against the biggest names in crypto with a season-long race for the championship. Bring glory to your token. Drive like a champion, win it all. Be first or last. If you're not rubbing, you're not racing. Get behind the wheel and drive for your project. All right, so that's the Ultimate Crypto Drivers Championship. Uh, VR1 Racing is a crypto-centric professional sim racing league, and it is uh, there for you to market what you're doing because it is increasingly difficult to get that done. So it provides a year-long entertaining platform that gives you ongoing exposure, full broadcast on YouTube, Twitch, Metaverse watch parties, design contests, and more. This is a really, really uh, solid marketing opportunity for you. So you can get some details at uffsports.com slash VR1. I can't wait. It, it looks just incredibly real. Uh, it is uh, simply just 
amazing. Uh, by the way, if you want to make a bet tonight on the big game or maybe something to do with Aaron Judge, head to BetUS. And if you want to bet responsibly, I have a 125% bonus that you can use on all sports. Just head to at Duck Millard, use the link in my bio, and boom, you get your 125% bonus. Put a bet on any game, any day, any time. All right, that is going to wrap things up for us. Thank you so much to Jamie Thomas, who joined us. Uh, Eric Grossman is going to join us uh, tomorrow. Uh, he was a guest a little ways back. I think he's going to be a Tuesday guest, so adding to our stable. I don't know what's happening with Mike Amato. I saw it today. Congratulations to him. He got, uh, got on with Sportsnet, so maybe that's what happened. You come on this show, you get noticed, you get on to Sportsnet, but Mike getting noticed for his uh, hard, hard work. So uh, hopefully we'll have Michael Amato still with us on Thursdays, but if not, we'll uh, look for other top-notch guests to join us uh, each and every day. Thank you so much for joining me on the program today. If you missed anything, it'll be up on YouTube uh, and we'll put it out in audio format as well. Thanks to Jamie Thomas. My name is Dean Millard. Have yourself a wonderful evening. Enjoy if it's the Jays and the Yankees. Enjoy hopefully Aaron Judge hitting a couple of home runs. And if you're a Jays fan, uh, hopefully you will enjoy a victory and also Monday night watch party right here on Twitch starting at 6 30 p.m. Eastern. Have yourself a great evening. We're back again tomorrow. Take care. Thanks, now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.